and decides that you know I need treatment. Unlike somebody with uh, uh, you know a heart problem or somebody with uh, some other problem. But the issue that most people face is how does does one motivate somebody to change? Because this, this this is about certain particular behaviors, and everybody is telling them you must change, and uh, uh, the person that you're talking about with the with the, the difficulties may or may not want to change, or may may or may not be in a position where he or she is willing to commit to change. So there are two possibilities. One is drag the person in, lock the person up, and uh, do whatever you have to do: take the clothes away, uh, you know, reduce the person to an ego egoless state. Uh, by by battering the person by saying uh, uh, lots of things to to the person. However, whichever way you do it, one needs to find a good way of uh, engaging the person in in behavioral change. And one of the one one of the big problems that one must talk about is that often when a when 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 your client or patient does not want to engage in change. The first thing that we do is saying that the person is resistant, that the person has resistance, and we must beat the resistance out of the person until uh, the person is able to engage in, uh, in 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 the process of change that we are advocating, that we are saying. Now, this is something that all treatment providers have. If the person comes to me and does not have the same explanatory model about the illness as I have, the person has no insight. If the person does not want to do what I want him to do, the person is resistant. And so, what does end up happening is that you end up butting heads, and if you butt heads, all you get is a headache, no change. Now, today we are going to talk about certain techniques which can be used and can be used very briefly. These are not very long-term techniques. These can be used in uh, interviews of five minutes or or or, or more, if required. Uh, but you know, as as brief as five minutes to help people. To bring about change, so I think Swati, I've had enough talking for the day. You go ahead with, yeah, and I'll butt in from time to time if necessary. Good afternoon. So with this background, let's understand the basic concepts inherent in motivational interviewing. So we all understand that motivation is a dynamic concept that it changes from uh, one time to another, and it is something that initiates, guides, and maintains behavior. It can be intrinsic in nature that. Comes from within, or something extrinsic, like a person wants to change or do something for somebody else in the environment. Uh, from the point of view of Prochaska and De Clemente model of readiness to change, motivation can be a person comes to uh, is in a stage of denial. I, I don't want to change. I don't need to change. To a stage where they may be ambivalent about change, then actually making some preparation about changing, taking an action, and finally either maintaining that kind of a lifestyle or actually going into a lapse or a relapse again. So to enhance motivation in the field of addiction medicine, the concept of motivational interviewing was introduced by Milan and Rolnick. Briefly described as a directive, client-centered counseling style for eliciting behavior change by helping clients to explore and resolve ambivalence. They said that the music or the spirit of MI is basically collaboration. That is, the client and the therapist works together to bring about the changes. Uh, it does not communicate the motivational interviewing or the uh, the spirit does not communicate that I know what you need. It communicates you have what uh, it is needed to be changed, and the therapist tries to evoke those motivational changes within the perspective and value system of the client. And most importantly, the therapist. Uh, believes in the autonomy and respects the autonomy of the client so basically in brief a practitioner who uses evocative methods of motivational interviewing dipped in the principles can bring about certain uh, desirable changes in the client which would lead to a behavior change however if a practitioner goes for advocacy method what dr benegal was talking about like confronting the client convincing trying to convince arguing teaching or preaching it will lead to a client wanting to remain in the status quo. Uh, also, can be remembered by the acronym DERN, that is, desire to remain the same, inability to change, reasons to remain the same. And uh, the client says, I don't need to change, I have all the reasons to remain the same, and ultimately there is no behavior change. So, what we will basically be doing in this session is we've kind of recorded a session with a uh, client for motivational interviewing. 
So in relevant portions, obviously I haven't covered all the components in one interview, but in relevant portions, we'll be playing those audio clips and we can discuss. The client is uh, Deepak, a 31 year old MBA, married, belonging to nuclear family, who works in a factory and presented to us with nicotine use in dependence fashions in the last uh, seven years and cannabis use in dependence patterns in the last four years. The detailed history had revealed no history of any other psychiatric problem, so pretty simple, straightforward case. At a personal level, the patient's work performance had declined and there were significant marital issues. So he was basically referred to me for individual sessions. So with that background, let's talk about what are the various evocative methods inherent in uh, motivational interviewing. The evocative methods can be remembered with the acronym ORSE. Open-ended question, affirmation, reflective listening, summarizing, and finally, how to elicit change talk. Open-ended question, as we all understand, are those which are difficult to answer with simple or brief replies like yes or no. They are kind of, they contain an element of surprise. You don't know what the client is going to tell you. They give an opportunity for the client to talk and can act as door openers. So just a few clips of how, uh, what kind of open-ended questions can be asked from a client. Good afternoon, Dr. Deepak. My name is Dr. Swati. I'm a clinical psychologist here. Uh, you have been referred to me by Dr. Sarita regarding your marijuana use. Would you like to talk about it? Tell me more about it. Uh, yes, good afternoon, Dr. As the other referring As basically, I came to the existence of my mind. Mm -hmm. She was really getting concerned mm -hmm. that I'm using too much of mm -hmm. and Because she was very much insisting on it. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. So what you're saying is that you basically came here because your wife has been insisting that you seek treatment. How do you feel about it? What do you think about it? I mean, I'm not really sure that I need treatment mm -hmm. because uh, for me, I don't think it has affected much. Mm -hmm. I think other than okay. Here's another one. Uh, your file says you've been using marijuana for almost like last four, four or five years. Uh, uh, what uh, made your wife concerned so much now? The one thing which she says is that you know, earlier I used to take only one smoke in a day, once a day. And now she says that, you know, I hoped to my time to be around four to Mm -hmm. And then she says that you know, it is a pet. Mm -hmm. It is making me more spiritual. It is making me uh, unhappy. It is causing me problems. So, would anybody want to comment on these audio clips? about uh, regarding the concept that we have just talked about um, house as well the first, question, the first question itself was uh, you know close ended what if he would have said no let us not discuss anything about it okay. uh, luckily he said yes so you could go for a open ended question okay okay uh, Dr. Sharanya, that was actually not really an open-ended question. With motivation and enhancement, what what is usually done is the permission of the person is taken, uh, and and that is a very important uh, technique that is that is done because and and this is very important because people are often brought in, as I said, uh, in a, in a coercive manner. So usually it is a good practice to take the permission of uh, of the patient or the client and. And it has been seen that once that is done, the client is more likely to own up, uh, you know, in, in the in the process. Is more likely to participate in the process. And uh, that is that that is a far better technique than the one that we usually follow, 
uh, where we keep asking so why have you come here so what are you doing where have you come how which bus did you come on uh, etc which 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 are the usual gambits which are used to uh, to to elicit some degree of uh, empathy uh, or, or uh, what is the word rapo yeah i think we'll move on affirmation is another way of evoke uh, as a evocative method basically affirming is uh, these are the statements that recognize the client's strength or uh, acknowledge behaviors that would lead to uh, positive changes some of the examples can be that i appreciate that you are willing to talk to me you handled yourself really well in that situation that's a good suggestion i have enjoyed talking to you today etc reflective listening is basically a type of active listening where the therapist not only listens to the stated but also tries to listen to the unstated thoughts feelings and meanings and reflects them back to the client the various ways of reflective techniques or various types of reflective techniques are simple reflection where the therapist acts as a mirror and simply acknowledges the disagreement feeling or perception a double sided reflection is when the therapist captures both sides of the ambivalence okay you want to change but you are not sure amplified reflection is when the therapist exaggerates what the person has uh, said so basically tries to include feelings that have not been stated explicitly sometimes it's important to shift focus if the person is too resistant to talk talk about their drug use or or you're getting stuck then you can kind of shift focus talk about something else set some other goals and see where the drug use would fit in later and then paraphrasing which is basically where you try to include the unstated meaning of the client paraphrasing is usually done when you had adequate uh, uh, interaction with the client you can reflect the, uh, you can understand what the client is trying to tell you even if it's not stated so for that there has to be at least a good amount of rapport with the client so again let's listen to some of the clips and then we can discuss the types of reflective uh, uh, listening used i think i use it almost uh, three days maybe one or two days may pass sometimes mm -hmm. when i don't use it mm -hmm. i like to use it every day Okay, so what I understand, let me just rephrase uh, the whole thing that uh, you've been using it for some time. You uh, find it, you like using it. You want to use it, but at the same time, your wife has some concerns. So, what do you think are her concerns? Uh, what has made her insist that you seek treatment? Okay, so one, she is concerned that it is affecting you. Uh, as a person, it is also affecting your relationship, which leads to fight and all, and uh, it is also affecting your work performance as you've not got a promotion. Uh, how many of these concerns do you think are valid? You think are valid? And the third clip. So, so what you're saying is that, uh, like every other couple, you do have fights, but um, uh, one major point of disagreement seems to be your marijuana use. are there any other points of disagreement in the marriage which leads to like uh, tensions or uh, uh, conflicts between the two of you i guess all the couples have been mm -hmm. like you know i want to go home, but i don't want to i want you to help me but help me this but it's in the time and the age so mm -hmm. Okay, so what I hear currently is that overall your relationship is okay. It's like any other normal couple, but this is one major point of disagreement between the two of you. Anybody here would like to discuss about the kind of reflective techniques used in these three audio clips? Uh, this is open to the house as well. So let's start with clip one. Let's give. Uh, um, would anybody like to say what type of reflection they thought it was dr lokesh uh, can i ask please go ahead uh, during this reflective listening procedure is it okay to ask that uh, you know when he's saying that my wife wants me to end this habit so is it okay to ask him that does it uh, you know 
aggravate your conflicts and uh, does it lead to a lot of uh, tensions in the family whenever you take and whenever you come back and she knows that you have taken it uh, right now dr amba we are just trying to explore the whole issue so if we move that far away that it leads to conflict to all uh, it eventually does come in the interview but at this moment we were just trying to explore what was happening on on the other hand i would probably agree with her and say that you know you could ask the same question instead of saying does it cause conflict i would ask it how does it uh, contribute to the conflict between because he's already talked about conflict uh, uh, with his with his wife earlier i would say how does this uh, contribute to the conflict uh, you know so i would ask it in the in the in the sense of an open ended question rather than what conflict does it cause or is it the only cause of conflict uh, yeah okay are, are there other forms of conflict uh, are, are there other other areas of conflict you know, etc so keep, the issue is keep it open ended because open ended means that you're keeping the ball rolling closed ended means end of conversation absolutely thank you uh, anybody else um, should we play it? Once more, with, uh, with any specific clip that you want them to uh, show or demonstrate, or shall we go on? Let's go. Okay, let's go. Because we're doing a very brief. In summarizing, is basically a special application of reflective listening, which is per particularly pertinent at transit points, like when you are moving from one topic to another, or you are towards the end of the session. You want to summarize. uh the advantages of using summarizing as a technique is that one it ensures that the communication has been clear you both are on the same plane second is that it provides the opportunity for the client to put in any additional information and also helps them to have a perspective of the entire conversation or whatever has been talked about just as an example of summarizing from the same uh, uh, interview so if i just need to summarize what we have talked about till now to understand the whole thing in our Take a perspective. You say that you're not. You don't really don't want to quit marijuana because you find some advantages of it, like in terms of it makes you happy. It uh, there are a lot of work and financial pressures, and it kinds of uh, help you in dealing with them or at least facing them because you're so stressed out at the end of the day. You really want to just take a joint or two or just to make uh, yourself feel relaxed. uh third you said that you been you have only a couple of friends left from workplace who are physically there and with whom you smoke so if you kind of leave it then even those two you won't be able to interact and for it just basically gives you pleasure you cannot imagine a life without marijuana right now but at the same time you do uh except that there are some disadvantages happening like it has affected your work performance to some extent it may or may not be related to your promotion like your wife feels it has become a major point of discontention between you and your wife with which leads to fights between you two and it has also led to kind of make you spend less quality time with her and uh at the same time if you do not get it if you are not able to do it you feel restless and your entire day gets ruined so these have been some of the pros and cons of using um, what do you think about them now basically what i was trying to do is reflect upon whatever the client has told me till now and summarize it for him yeah uh, what also you would have noticed swati has done and done very well is that she has enhanced the ambivalence that there is a there are positives and there are negatives and a, 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 a the therapist job at all times is to enhance the ambivalence is to increase the difference between the pluses and the minuses so and that is what she did she said you are gaining so much benefits out of this and yet you're losing so much you know and that is something that you get the client to say in his or her own words and that enhances the ambivalence and, and that is the enhancing amb ambivalence is the the one major thing that you do through motivation enhancement and if you if you remember nothing else about what we have said today the one thing is enlarge ambivalence what is it enhance ambivalence that is the most important thing amplify ambivalence in forward uh eliciting how do you elicit change talks 
one of the ways can be audio share just give us a minute we are just okay you can take uh, some questions yeah i think the slides are not not moving so i'm trying to sort it out give one minute time uh, how a question how to conduct motivation in those who lie for the sake of family pressure <coughs> is it not possible so somebody lying if somebody is really not telling truth because of family pressure how to do is it not possible is it is intermediate to rabikant is written that how you do the motivation uh i mean lying is not something that we really uh we we take into uh, i mean we we do take into account the fact that when people come they will be forced to say things like oh i want to get uh, want to stop tomorrow uh and and that is under family pressure and part of the motivational interviewing technique is to 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 be able to uh reduce the pressure so we are able to in real time talk about the pros and cons of starting i mean so if somebody says yeah yeah doctor i mean i'm going to stop tomorrow i will then go and talk about you know why do you want to stop how are you going to stop who will help you stop what will happen if you uh, if you 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 don't have uh, the feeling to stop tomorrow so what i will do is get the person to run through both the pros and the cons with uh, stopping and not stopping so i as a motivational therapist will take at face value what the person uh, is, is saying to me i will not be sitting there as a judge wondering whether the person is lying or not lying so the the, the biggest thing that uh, the other big thing that one needs to do is that we know one needs to avoid um confront confrontation the you know one of the things that we talk about when we are doing motivational enhancement is that it's like doing judo as opposed to uh, to to wrestling uh, sumo wrestling where you are using your force against the other person's force which is what we tend to do as therapists that we try to browbeat somebody into changing but in motivational interviewing it's like using judo a very small person can use the opponent's superior force to unseat the opponent and it's like dancing you use your partner to dance with the partner uh, and and therefore you don't waste your time thinking is the guy lying to me or not you get the person to explore his or her position i think we are back I, i think we all are back we also have a question which is almost similar to the to some related it's that it's from dr chetna when the person completely denies any kind of medical help how do we go ahead okay i think we'll come to that yeah. uh, uh, at the end as to what do you do what are the menu of changes etc so we'll yes. do that later it's a, it's a very important question yeah. by the way and that we will answer later So some of the specific techniques for eliciting change talk uh, has been uh, given as one is a readiness ruler where you ask the person to rate on a scale of zero to ten that at this moment how important it is for you to change, and a confident ruler as in at this moment how confident do you feel that you would change, and then you kind of keep on probing why not choose a lower number if the person has chosen say seven why not a four and the, and why not a higher number what are the obstacles. uh that you uh, are anticipating and what would it take to help you reach a higher number of say a 9 or a 10 yeah well, having said that we are, we are also i mean without using ruler etc it's a very good technique to use but you are all the time as a motivational uh, inter, uh, therapist you're trying to get the person to make statements for change and it can be i'm dissatisfied with what is happening i have too much pain with uh, my current uh, existence i am look forward to change uh, so and and that is something that you listen for and you help amplify by asking more questions about that somebody says you know what my wife is really pissing the hell out of me uh, and then you say okay so you know what does that mean i mean and he says look this my life is becoming intolerable why is it intolerable it is intolerable because i'm using substances and that is a statement for change you know so you try and get the person to make statements about change pro change statements and which is about eliciting change talk the uh, second can be a query about extreme that is a what if there's a target yeah, behavior the thing, so what is the worst thing that would happen if you did change and what is the best thing that could happen if you did change 
Uh, third technique can be looking forward or looking backward, like asking a person to kind of uh, project of how life would be if they suppose achieve this target behavior of change, and how life would be one or two years from now or even six months from now. And then one can also ask how life was before all this started. Just to give an example for that. What are your sources of happiness, or what would make you feel happy otherwise when you were not taking money? Hey, Go out, you know, watch a movie, mm-hmm. go out, go to a fast food restaurant, matches mm-hmm. used to have so friends would come, but we all would sit together and watch a cricket match. In general, just be all those things we did. My wife was a large part of our team. And together we have from home friends, other friends, my friends. We friends for two weeks from home. So, so basically, this was just to show how. Uh, it's just a technique a person uh, can be made to reflect back about how life was, how good things were happening when the person was not using a particular drug. It will help them to reflect on how life could be if they stop using or change their behavior. Moving to the next technique, like what we about what I also demonstrated during the summary thing was kind of decisional balancing. You ask the person to reflect upon what are the benefits of changing or the consequences of changing. All the benefits or consequences of remaining the same. Sorry, again, we're having a few. Uh, technical if you on the video, the audio it gets uh, it gets locked in piece and down. Please give me a minute. I'll, I'll have to just stop and start it again. It gets locked, is it? <coughs> So if you wait for a little more time, you can get the media clips. Those will wait an incentive for them to get a media clips. I think we have a very long question. Okay, I will take out the question, correct? Yeah, I think Dr. Saranya will obviously send you media clips. Yeah, you, Dr. Saranya wanted the clips of uh, Swati's, we will send you. The one question from Best Hospital, Delhi. Let me check, where is it? That's an interesting question. The question is a little bit. We are in a in this army hospital. We are in a conflict situation where the therapist is the person who will recom- recommend whether the person will be kept in job if he improves expectedly or he is removed from the job if he does not. And this decision has to be taken in a fixed time frame, say about two years or so. Is he if he is honest with us and improve and improves, he remains in job, or else not job. How do you think we should modify out? Modify out motivational interviewing in this apparently lose lose situation. No, my question, my answer to that was: you modify nothing. Uh, you know, you uh, be truthful to uh, the con- the consequences that uh, you know can can occur, and uh, you uh, again, as as Swati is now going to talk about this whole decisional balance. It's the benefits of changing and the consequences of not changing. Uh, and and these are things which you need to discuss with the person. So if a person can be boarded out because it's not going to change, that needs to be part of this decisional balance that Swati is now going to talk about. So I think Swati, uh, go ahead. So uh, as I already had kind of played in the clip also, there is a technique called decisional balancing where the person is made to realize that obviously there are some advantages of changing and disadvantages of changing too. So. To help them understand the thing as a just all, you know, just all as a whole, what are the benefits or consequences of changing their current behavior, and what are the benefits and consequences of not changing their current behavior? Again, most of these techniques work if they come from the client. I mean, if you tell them that if you change, this will happen, and if you do not change, this will not happen, does not work. Let them come out with these. What are the benefits or consequences of making or not making a change for them? Another way can be exploring their goals and values and understanding how drug use has affected it and how drug use uh, fits in all in there. Like, 
Can you just play the audio clip? You said your wife was a large part of the entire process of being happy, doing things together, going out. How has that changed? No, like I am also feeling the pressure. Because of you know all this economic downturn, other company also suffered. So we have been asked to work longer now, spend more time. All these activities have decreased, and all these activities have decreased. I don't, we don't really go out right now. Do you think your marijuana use is any part to play in that? One is obviously her work pressures and your work pressures and uh, fast paced lifestyle and everything. Do you think your drug use is a part of that? It obviously has because he's clearly not happy. Name have had a minor performance to become and that in turn is also being Finally, one of the last technique for eliciting change can be a change plan. Once the client has said that they would like to change then developing a change plan. An example can be the client can list down the changes they want to make. What are the important reasons why they want to make this change? How are, this, how are they going to make these changes? Uh, the way other people can help me make those changes, some of the things that can interfere with my plan. This is kind of an answer to the question that arose that what if a person is lying? If you actually go on to discuss these things, it will help you also understand what they have in mind. Uh, and it will also help them understand whether they really would be able to make this change and would be willing to make these changes or not. So we have talked about the evocative methods. Let's, let's go on to the principles of motivational interviewing, which can be remembered with the acronym DARES. Uh, so we'll go to them one by one. Developing discrepancy, the basic assumption is that if you are able to create a discrepancy between the current behavior and the important goals that the person has, this will help them in uh, having a perspective about why there is a need for a change. So what I try to do with the client was, just a second. So, so you feel one of the most important goals of your life is to have a healthy or a happy family life. How you do understand that marijuana use doesn't fit there. At the same time, you are yourself not very sure that you want to quit. How do you think this can be made possible? Or how do you think you go at it? So what I was trying to basically do was to help the client kept on telling me that the most important thing for him was his relationship with his wife. So taking that and also and Various points he indicated that his marijuana use, which was affecting him as a person and his work performance, was creating problems. So I tried to understand how does he plan to reach the level of a healthier relationship with the wife and how his marijuana use fits in there. Second is obviously you uh, avoid all sorts of arguments. If a patient is arguing, you do not argue back as Sir was saying that you do not break head with the client. We all face various types of resistance when we are dealing with uh, our clients. Some of the common examples can be they argue back. They tend to completely deny. I don't think I need a change. I don't think I have a problem. They, they would say that they would do things. They would be shaking their heads left, right, and center, but would actually be ignoring you. Or they would be interrupting. Oh, I have done this before. Oh, I know what you're talking about. Oh, the last therapist also told me. So again, you, we do not oppose resistance. Resistance is basically a signal for the therapist to behave differently. So you shift focus, talk about something else. You do not 
wrestle with the client as sir said you dance with the client it's it's like just be with the client it's okay he has his own reasons for uh, saying what he's saying so you don't have to argue with the client for that empathy uh, as we all understand empathy simple words putting yourself in other person's shoes uh, can be defined as a specifiable and learnable skill for understanding another's meaning meaning of another person using reflective listening that we have spoken about it requires sharp attention to each new client statement and you continuously need to generate hypothesis in your mind about what the client is stating and not stating and its underlying meaning and exploring each session is about exploring the client more and more and finally self efficacy self efficacy is basically the client's belief that they can change and it is very directly related to the counselor's belief that they can change so if the counselor believe that a client can change it becomes kind of a self fulfilling prophecy so how do you do that do that you support hope and optimism by bringing out their strength they have they've probably done it before so they can do it now and telling them to take one day at a time so through the use of these evocative methods dipped in the principles of motivational interviewing the therapist is able to achieve a kind of motivational state in the client which is a desire to change that is i wish to or i want to the client would generate statements like i know i can i have the ability to change i i can give it a try reason i want to change because of uh, my wife's not happy my work is suffering i am feeling very restless it is important for me and i really need to make this change and finally the a uh, client commits that yes i plan to do something about it or i will do something about it so just to hear the last clip it seems you have made some efforts at some point of time but because of craving or the restlessness you end up taking it again so uh do you think that if we help you in kind of helping you deal with stress in another other ways and uh, deal with the stresslessness and everything you might be open to coming back again and discussing how to uh, change basically this was a brief about a 15 20 minutes interview in which i was able to achieve that i was able to establish a therapeutic re relationship with the client i was able to clarify certain issues that are in maintaining factors or uh, for the drug use develop a discrepancy between his current state and his future goals and there was a slight motivational shift where he the initial thing was that my wife brought me here and i don't think i need to change to i think i can give it a try and further plans was to again engage in uh, uh, decisional balancing deciding upon the treatment options or the menu of options available for treatment establishing a formal change plan and strengthening commitment so just to summarize the spirit of motivational interviewing is uh, uh, can be remembered as collaboration autonomy and evocative uh, methods the evocative strategies are ors e which is open ended questions affirmation reflective uh, reflective listening and uh, summarizing and uh, eliciting change talk principles of uh, motivational interviewing can be remembered with the acronym dares and finally all this would lead to a change talk in client which is dance e which is a desire to change ability to change reason and need to change and finally making a commitment for change with this i thank you for your patient listening uh we don't have any questions on chat uh, one you can take it yeah. so one question from dr ravikant how to continue mi like more in interviewing if patient is confident about himself or to quit after discharge but there is no you know there is no reason no explanation how he could deal the craving when he tells is confident but doesn't give an explanation to that would anybody like to uh, the question is about how do you deal with a client who is no uh, you don't ask him about any other any question, question from your side 
uh, your chat is active so you can see in chat but uh, please unmute yourself and go ahead any suggestion any questions any clarification so this is lukesh from impact yeah uh, good congratulations to dr swati for uh, for giving such a nice presentation thank you uh, so all the principle that we have taught you know from my experience whatever little experience i have i think apart from all the principle no such certain uh, principle of you no know, uh, automatic way of approach is also include like the main important thing is giving feedbacks i think sometimes like you know, giving feedback from the patient investigation or some kind of you no know, enhancement of his education about the ill effects of the insufficiency of alcohol or cannabis you know uh, do sometimes help us to decrease the resistance from the patient uh, part so though it may be you no know, uh, not a exact principle of the uh, evocative uh, way of uh, dealing with the patient but feedback sometimes do help a lot i think i i also like to uh, uh, like to have a comment from dr venikal on this part sir uh, uh lokesh thank you for the question i mean one of the one of the things that we try and avoid in motivational interviewing is premature advice see we are all trained as doctors and the first thing that we do as soon as the patient comes in is say you know raise your hand let's see your uh, throat do this but in mental health that is not something that uh, you know is is very very uh, effective and especially in addiction where uh, you know uh, we have been dealing with certain behaviors where doctors uh, traditionally haven't had uh too much of a say in uh, that can be counterproductive and motivational interviewing giving advice prematurely is often very counterproductive having said that uh giving advice or a rather exposing a person to what the person uh, what what is known about the particular condition is a very valuable thing and and that needs to be done again uh, after this entire process has been gone through and so what i'll what i'll just do just to finish off is to give you some sort of an algorithm four steps basically four simple steps uh, you know whenever we talk about motivational interviewing techniques it sounds very uh, complicated it's not complicated at all you can do it within 5 3 to 5 minutes the first thing that you do when your client comes in is actually don't beat about the bush and and this is something that you know all trainees psych- uh, your therapists have a problem of saying well, how do i uh, establish rapport so you st- like i said you start asking about where he has come from etc but you're not bearding the actual thing that you know he's come with a drug and alcohol problem so don't be shy of doing that the first thing that you do don't beat about the bush say that you know i understand from your history sheet or i understand from your family members that this is an issue and is it okay if we talk about this particular issue i understand that you have been brought because your relatives are very very worried about your cannabis uh, intake is it okay if we talk about this so start is step number 1 and that sets the field step number 2 like uh, swati said is to is to is to enhance the ambivalence every human being is, is in a state of ambivalence and especially people with drug and alcohol problems should the person go on with their behavior which is causing so much pain or should the person change their behavior but with the fear that they will lose control and they they will not uh, you know uh, be able to do whatever little they can do so what one does uh, is to play a little bit of uh, good cricket you know i mean most people everybody in their brothers and sisters has been telling them this is bad you need to stop you need to stop so start with the opposite ask about the good things what are the good things what are the things uh, that benefit you through the through the use of this behavior you know what would you miss if you had to give give this up and uh, use open ended uh, techniques to be able to uh, prolong the conversation to get the person to actually while the person is talking to you remember the person is actually examining his or her motivations uh, you know for uh, this particular behavior having said that next counterpoint it counter counter it with what are the not so good things what are the things you would not miss if you had to give this up what are the things you look forward to if you uh, you know stop this particular behavior because motivational interviewing is not just about drug and alcohol behavior it's about any behaviors where you need to bring about change then what you need to again contrast is with how it fits in with your life your life goals you know 
you're doing this, you're doing this with Swati uh, did so very well. That how does this fit in? Where do you want to be five years from now? Where do you want to be 10 years from now? Where do you want, what do you want to do in life? You know, sometimes, uh, you know, I often ask the question, you know, I give you, if, if a good fairy came and gave you three wishes, what would you wish for? And everybody, you know, just one second before you die, you still have something you wish for, something you wish to do, something you wish to live for, something you dream for. And everybody has that. And how does this fit in with that? And this is a very crucial part of the therapeutic uh, exchange because if you, if you uh, see your client very carefully, you will find that this is a time when people just stop, think, and often you know, their Adam's apple bobs a little because you know, their emotional issues related to this you know, come into fore. You know, sometimes you, you see a little tearing up in their eyes and that's what you are looking for. You know? technique wise so the next thing is okay so now what do you want to do where do you go from here and as somebody asked a little while back that some people will say i don't want to do anything that's good too you know the, the fact that the guy has got up and come and made you know come to visit you is the most brilliant step that has occurred motivational interviewing is about taking people step by step you don't try to win the battle on day one you know a little change is good enough and so some people will say, yes, I, I think I need to make a change. So then what is the change you need to make? And as Swati was saying, there's a menu of change. This you can do. Who will help you? Uh, what happens if this doesn't work for? You work for smart goals, goals which are specific goals. It's not, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm going to give up uh, smoking and drinking and become a good person from day after tomorrow. It's not that. What are you going to do in the next two weeks? So it needs to be specific. It must be meaningful. It must be meaningful to the person and it also needs to make meaning to the family members. It should be accessible. After two weeks when I come back, I need to know whether you, you, know, you kept up to what you said you would do or you were able to do or not able to do that. It should be realistic. It's not that you know, I'm going to change the uh, complexion of uh, the world in, in two weeks. And it should be timed. It's not about, you know, I'm going to do it. Sometime next year, I'm going to do it. And you should, before the guy goes out, have this uh, agreement with, with the person and say that I want to see you in such and such a uh, time. There will be people who will say, I don't want to do anything. It's fine. Then you say, then you make the contract saying that, you know, can I give you something? Can I give you some advice? Can I give you some material where you can read up about this? No, I don't even want that. I just want to go. Great. I'm going to be sitting here. If you want to come and meet me anytime, I will be here on Tuesdays and Wednesdays from so and so time to so and so time. You'd be surprised at the number of people who come back within two weeks. Yeah? So basically, this is about the spirit of motivation interviewing. I am very clear about, I, I talk about motivation interviewing. I don't talk about motivation enhancement therapy because motivational interviewing is a technique that we use day in and day out. I use it with you when I talk to you. I use it with my client and I try to use it with my daughter, but sometimes I fail.